the way things are. The De Rerum Natura of Titus Lucretius Carus, translated by Ralph Humphreys. Book One Creatress, mother of the Roman line, dear Venus, joy of earth and joy of heaven, all things that live below that heraldry of star and planet whose processional moves ever slow and solemn over us, all things conceived, all things that face the light in their bright visit, the grain-bearing fields, the marionered oceans, where the wind and cloud are quiet in your presence, all proclaim your gift, without which they are nothingness. For you, that sweet artificer, the earth submits her flowers, and for you the deep of ocean smiles, and the calm heaven shines with shoreless light. Ah, goddess, when the spring makes clear its daytime, and a warmer wind stirs from the west, a procreative air, high in the sky, in <clears throat> high in the sky, the happy-hearted birds, responsive to your coming call and cry, the cattle tame no longer, swim across the rush of river torrents, or skip and bound in joyous meadows where your brightness leads. They follow gladly, taking in the drive, the urge of love to come. So on you move over the seas and mountains, over streams whose ways are fierce, over the greening leaves, over the leafy tenements of birds, so moving that in all the ardor burns, for generation and their kinds increase. Since you alone control the way things are, since without you no thing has ever come into the radiant boundaries of light, since without you nothing is ever glad and nothing ever lovable I need, I need you with me, goddess, in the poem. I try to write here, on the way things are. This book will be for Memenus, Memius, a man your blessing has endowed with excellence, always and always, therefore all the more to give our book a radiance, a grace, brightness, and candor, over land and sea, meanwhile to soldiery's fierce duty bring a slumber, an implacable repose, since you alone can help with tranquil peace the human race and Mars, the governor of war's fierce duty, more than once has come, gentled by love's eternal wound, to you, forgetful of his office, head bent back, no more the rough neck gazing up at you, gazing and gaping, all agog for love, his every breath dependent on your lips, Ah, goddess, pour yourself around him. Bend with all your body's holiness above his supine meekness. Drown him in persuasion, imploring for the Romans' blessed peace. For this is something that I cannot do with mind untroubled in this troubled time. Nor can a son of Memaeus, says noble house, falter at such a crisis or betray the common weal. For what in news ensues, my friend, listen with ears attentive and a mind cleared of anxiety. Hear the reasoned truth, and do not without understanding treat my gifts with scorn, my gifts disposed for you. With loyal industry I shall begin with a discussion of the th scheme of things, as it regards the heaven and powers above. Then I shall state the origin of things, the seeds from which nature creates all things, bids them increase and multiply in turn, how she resolves them to their elements, and after their course is run, these things we call matter, the life motes, or the seeds of things, if we must find in schools a name for them. Firstlings, we well might say, since everything follows from these beginnings. 
when human life all too conspicuous lay foully groveling on earth weighed down by grim religion looming from the skies horribly threatening mortal men a man a greek first raised his mortal eyes bravely against this menace no report of gods no lightning flash no thunder peal made this man cower but drove him all the more with passionate manliness of mind and will be and will to be the first to spring the tight bared gates of nature's hold asunder so his force his vital force of mind a conqueror beyond the flaming ramparts of the world explored the vast immensities of space with wit and wisdom and came back to us triumphant bringing news of what can be and what cannot limits and boundaries the borderline the friend the benchmark set forever religion so is trampled underfoot and by his victory we reach the stars i fear that in these matters you may think you're entering upon a path of crime the abc's of godlessness not so the opposite is true too many times religion mothers crime and wickedness recall how once at alis when the greeks those chosen peers the very first of men defiled with a girl's blood the altar stone sacred to artemis the princess stood wearing the sacred fillets or a veil and sensed but could not see the king her father agamemnon standing sorrowful beside the altar and the priests nearby hiding the knife blade and the folk in tears at what they saw she knelt she spoke no word she was afraid poor thing much good it did her at such a time to have been the very first to give the king that other title father raised by men's hands and trembling she was led toward the altar not to join in song after the ritual of sacrifice to the bright god of marriage no she fell a victim by the sacrificing stroke her father gave to shed her virgin blood not the ways not the way virgins shed it but in death to bring the fleet a happy exodus a mighty counsellor religion stood with all that power for wit goodness you may yourself some time or other feel like turning away from my instruction terrified by priestly rant how many fantasies they can invent to overturn your sense of logic muddle your estates by fear and rightly so for if we ever saw a limit to our troubles we'd be strong registers of religion rant and cant but as things are we have no chance at all with all their everlasting punishments waiting us after death we do not know the nature of the soul it is is it something born by of and for itself does it find its way into ourselves when we are being born to die when we do or does it after our death tour hell's tremendous emptiness and shadow or does it by divine commandment find abode in lower beasts as we are told by roman aeneas the first of us chapleted with the green of helicon bright shining through the realms of italy but still he also tells us in his verse immortal as it is that acheron has reaches where no souls or bodies dwell but only phantoms pale and wondrous wise and that from the um, their immortal homer's image so aeneas says transferred itself to him and wept and talked about all kinds of things so we had better have some principle in our discussion of celestial ways under what system both the sun and moon wheel in their courses and what impulse moves events on earth and more than that we must see our principle is shrewd 
and sound when we consider what the spirit is, wherein the nature of the mind consists what fantasy it is that strikes our wits with terror in our waking hours or sickness in our or in sleep's sepulchre, so that we see or think we do and hear most audible those whose dead bones earth holds in her enfolding. I am well aware how very hard it is to bring to light by means of Latin verse the dark discoveries of the Greeks. I know new terms must be invented, since our tongue is poor and this material is new, but I am persuaded by your excellence and by our friendship's dear expectancy to suffer any toil to keep my watch through the still nights seeking the words, the song whereby to bring your mind that splendid light by which you can see darkly hidden things. Our terrors and our darknesses of mine must be dispelled not by the sunshine's rays, not by those shining arrows of the light, but by insight into nature and a scheme of systematic contemplation. So our starting point shall be this principle. Nothing at all is ever born from nothing by the God's will. Ah, but men's minds are frightened because they see on earth and in heaven many events whose causes are to them impossible to fix. So they suppose the God's will is the reason. As for us, once we have seen that nothing comes from nothing, we shall perceive with greater clarity what we are looking for whence each thing comes, how things are caused, and know God's will about it. Now if things come from nothing, all things could produce all kinds of things. Nothing would need seed of its own. Men would burst out of the sea, and fish and birds from earth, and wild or tame all kinds of beasts of dubious origin, inhabit deserts and the greener fields. Nor would the same trees bear in constancy the same fruit always, but as like as not oranges would appear on apple boughs if things were not produced after their kind, each from its own determined particles. How could we trace the substance to the source? But now, since all things crea all created things have come from their own definite kinds of seed, they move from their beginnings toward the shores of light out of their primal motes. Impossible that all things issue on free winds, each kind of substance has its own inherent power by its, its own capacity. Does not the rose blossom in spring, the wheat come ripe in summer, the grape burst forth at autumn's urge? There must be a proper meeting of their seeds in time for us to see them at maturity, grown by the season's favor, living earth bringing them safely to the shores of light. But if they came from nothing, they might spring to birth at any unpropitious time. Who could predict, since there would be no seeds whose character rules out untimely union? Thirdly, if things could come from nothing, time would not be of the essence. For their growth, their ripening to full maturity, babies would be young men in the blink of an eye, and full-grown forests come leaping out of the ground from the ground. Ridiculous! We know that all things grow little by little, as indeed they must from their essential nature. A further point, at certain times of year, earth needs the rain for happy harvest, and both beasts and men need nature's bounty for their lives increase, a mutual dependence of the sort that words need letters for. Do not believe in any world without its ABCs. Moreover, why could nature not bring forth men huge enough to wade the deepest oceans, split mountains with their hands, and outlive time? The answer is that limits have been set, fixing the bounds of all material, its character, its growth. And finally, since we observe that cultivated soil excels untended land, gives better yield, it must be obvi obvious that earth contains life-giving particles 
we bring to birth in breaking clods, in turning surface under. If there were no such particles, our toil would be ridiculous, for things would grow better and better of their own accord, but nothing comes from nothing. This we must acknowledge all things have to have the seed which gives them impulse toward the gentle air. Our second axiom is this, that nature resolves each object to its basic atoms, but does not ever utterly destroy it. If anything could perish absolutely, it might be suddenly taken from our sight. There would be no need of any force to smash it, disrupt and shatter all its fastenings. But as it is, since everything coheres because of its eternal seed, its essence, until some force is strong enough to break it by violent impact, or to penetrate its void interstices, and so dissolve it, nature permits no visible destruction of anything. Besides, if time destroys completely what it banishes from sight, without the procession of passing the passing years, out of what source does Venus bring again the race of animals, each after its own kind, to their light of life? And how, being restored, in, is each thing fed, sustain and give an increase by our miraculous contriving earth? And what supplies the seas, the native springs, the far-off rivers? And what feeds the stars? By rights, if things can perish infinite time and ages past should have consumed them all. But if throughout this history there can have been renewals and the sum of things can stay, beyond all doubt there must be things possessed of an Immortal essence, nothing can disintegrate entirely into nothing. An indiscriminate common violence would finish everything except for this. Matter is indestructible. It holds all things together, though the fastenings vary in tightness. Otherwise, a touch, the merest touch, would be a cause of death a force sufficient to dissolve an air. Textures of mortal substance, but here's the fact. The elements are held, are bound together in different degrees, but the basic stuff is indestructible, so things remain intact unharmed until a force is found proportionate to their texture to effect reversion to their primal elements, but never to complete annihilation. Finally, when the fathering air has poured his rainfall into Mother Earth, the drops seem to have gone, but look, bright harvests arise. Bows on the trees bring greenery and growth, and are weighted down by fruit, by which in turn our race is fed, and so are animals, and we see happy cities flowering with children, and we hear the music rise, as new birds sing all through the leafy woods, Fat cows lie down to rest their weary sides in welcome pastures, and the milk drops white out of distended udders, and the calves romp over the tender grass or wobble drunk on that pure vintage more than strong enough for any such experience as theirs. To sum up, no visible object dies. Nature from one thing brings another forth and out of death new life is born. Now then I have shown that things can never be created from nothing, and that no created thing can ever be called back into nothingness. You may perhaps begin to doubt my lessons, since atoms are too small to see, but listen, you must admit that there are other bodies existing but invisible. The wind beats ocean with its violence, overwhelms great ships, sends the clouds flying, or at times sweeps over land with a tornado's fury, strewing with plains that with the trees and beating mountains with forced shattering blasts. Its roaring howls aloud and wild, and even its mutter threatens. Surely, most surely, the winds are unseen bodies, sweepers of earth and sea and sky, and whirlers of sudden hurricane. They flow, they flood, they breed destruction just the way a river 
of gentle nature swells to a great deluge by the increase of rainfall from the mountains commingling in ruin broken brush and trees strong bridges cannot hold the sudden fury of water coming on the river darkened by the great rain dashes against the piles oh with mighty force and with a mighty sound roars on destroying under its current it rolls tremendous rocks it sweeps away whatever resists its surge so the wind's blast must also be a strong river a fall of devastation wherever it goes shoving some things before it attacking over and over in eddy and whirl having its way seizing and carrying things i tell you again and again the winds are bodies invisible they are rivals of great rivers in what they do and are the rivers of course are something we can see